So this is my, my day job, really. I am a lawyer, but I'll try and keep this as uh, non-legal as possible. I used to uh, lecture law, and I'd always refuse to do early morning lectures. I refused to do 9 o'clock lectures, and the university got quite upset. I said, because you can't teach anybody law at 9 o'clock. I certainly could never learn law. This is meant to be a practical talk anyway. It's to explain what Europe have been doing. And Europe is the European Festivals Association. It's 80 strong. Um, it includes big festivals like Roskilde and Exit and Zigit, but it includes a host of smaller festivals. It covers almost every single European country now. And it's moving to Russia. Um, and it's uh, like AFE, it's, it's a great representative organization. Now then, this is a bit of law. What do we all sign when we sign contracts? Well, I'll tell you as a lawyer, most of the time, you don't know what you're signing, because you sign artists not knowing really what you're signing up to. This is a standard, I just copied this off an agency uh, contract. I'm going to read this bit to you. It is hereby agreed the promoter engages the artist, and the artist agrees to appear on the date and the venues and the fees specified. Fantastic. We all know that. That's how you book bands. You give them a date for a festival. You might give them a stage. You'd agree a fee. You'd agree a time slot. You might even agree to support bands with them if they're a headliner. That's what you do. But what agents like to do, because they represent artists, is then to agree to the artist's rider and any other clauses they would like to put in the contract, which probably haven't been negotiated. And that's been a problem. I, I, I'm the lawyer for Glastonbury, and that was become an increasing problem at Glastonbury over the years. We introduced our own standard terms about five years ago now, because I was getting books arriving on my desk and our production team are getting books arriving normally the week before the festival, which was the artist rider, which would contain things which had never, ever been discussed and let alone would or could be agreed. We're a field in Somerset. We don't have the facilities of a stadium. So particularly American contracts we were receiving, American riders we were receiving, which would be a stadium to a rider, we could never hope to comply with. And so we had to take moves to protect ourselves, and a lot of it is, was done on goodwill, but we had to take moves to protect ourselves, particularly against some of the rider clauses, which extended beyond just demanding ludicrous things backstage, but also, for example, wanted to control our security. I had a very interesting conversation with an American tour director who insisted he should be in charge of the festival security. And I was quite angry that day, I think, so I said, OK, you need to give me 200 badged badged SIA approved supervisors because we have 3,000 stewards you'll be in charge of. We have a four and a half mile perimeter fence. We have 20 main and over 150 other smaller performance areas that I know about. And the guy started stuttering saying, I didn't mean that. I said, I know you didn't mean it, but that's what you keep telling me you want to be in charge of. And that's important. If you're not in charge of your own security, you've got a problem. And the problem with riders is, you probably never read them, you've certainly not agreed to them, and they always have budget implications if you have to implement them. And that's, I suppose, the main problem. There are budget implications. So the Europe standard terms, which I've developed with Europe over the last three years, are meant to be default terms. They're a standard set of terms which would override any rider that you get sent. So they're not that comprehensive. We've picked out the main areas which all of the festivals any festival anywhere probably has to come to terms with when they get riders. They can be overridden. What we always say to the agents, and I do understand agents why they do this, they're representing their artists. We say, look, if we, can, if we agree things with you, of course, put it in the contract. If we can agree things in advance, put it in the contract. That's fine, of course we'll honour that. But don't send us riders a week before the event and hope and pray and then threaten us if we can't comply with them. So default terms were developed by Europe to try and counteract the worst excesses of riders. Just a bit of fun. I, these are some of the ones I've received over the years. Um, fully equipped games parlour with an arcade-style ambiance, full-size video games and a monster TV with the latest PlayStation. Two smartly dressed, well-groomed hostesses to assist in serving food in the band lounge and a 12-foot snooker table. We're Glastonbury in a field. We don't actually have a 12-foot snooker table anywhere. Um, 20 leafy six-foot plants, four leafy four-foot plants, vegetarian catering only, and absolutely no animal byproducts anywhere, including the furniture and carpets. Uh, we're a dairy farm, uh, always a bit of a problem. Uh, uh, 
20 phone lines. I mean, this is a rider I got recently. 20, no one has landlines anymore because all tour, I mean, even the tour directors don't want this. But they never change it. So it's in the contract. Um, I haven't put this one up, but Morrissey did actually manage to get one Belgium festival to go fully vegetarian last year. In some ways, you should applaud him. They hadn't planned to, but they'd signed up the contract agreement to the rider, and riders in his 2011, I think, tour rider was a clause saying there must be no meat on site. So they had to, and they signed that. So well, they signed a contract agreeing to sign that. So they were done. The last one I just put up there, then there's, you've got personal vegan chef, own dry cleaner, personal acupuncturist, yoga instructor, own furniture backstage, 30 security, well done Madonna. And uh, I love the last one though, no toy robots, no plastic seahorses, and two heavy duty floor mounted fans so I can wear a scarf and pretend to be on a Bon Jovi video. <laughs> That's Iggy Pop and I applaud him for that though, because that is actually quite funny. And uh, good for him for doing that. But obviously, if you do sign a contract agreeing to that, as a lawyer, I will tell you, you are agreeing to that in a legal document, and you should provide that. So the Europe terms are meant to counteract that, saying we're not going to agree to anything unless we have agreed it. And this has been a big change in the relationship between agents and festivals. And I accept a lot of it was done in the past on goodwill. But uh, after a few, and it wasn't just Glastonbury, in fact, very little at Glastonbury was it ever a problem, but a lot of the European festivals started to realise they were very exposed if and when things might go wrong, or where they simply couldn't provide what was being asked for, or when they were asked late for something, it had huge budget implications. So remember one of the festivals said, well, we had a £45,000 bill for a video wall we had to install, because we'd unwittingly not, well, we hadn't realised that was in the artist tour rider. £45,000 to a 20,000 capacity festival is a lot of money. It's a lot of tickets you've got to sell to cover that. And if you're sold out and you've budgeted on a sellout, you've just got to find that money out of profit or even going to a loss. So there has been a need for festivals to do this, but there has been a, a reluctance on behalf of some agents to actually deal with it. Free Trade described describe my lovely Europe terms as that bullshit document. Um, well, they're entitled to. Uh, X-Ray Turing said, or one of the agents said, I don't accept any centralised terms for any set of festivals at any time and will not be bound by them, although the agency itself, of course, issues its own standard terms. Um, what we've been trying to say is, we will agree, if we can agree things, let's agree them. If things have a budget implication, we need to know up front so we can budget for them. We had, and we are in continue to have long discussions and intricate discussions with William Morris on behalf of William Morris and CAA, two big American agencies, both with London offices. Uh, they have been productive. We have made some changes to our standard terms, um, listening to them, trying to get to an agreed set of terms. It's ongoing, though. It's ongoing. There have been some changes. Um, William Morris and Richie told us they couldn't change their standard terms until the recent uh, problems in Ukraine when suddenly they actually put a new clause in their standard terms about, um, well, I don't actually know what it's about, it's American law, it's to do with uh, people on their prohibited persons list and uh, sanctions and US trade sanctions, which none of us know anything about at all. Um, but we have had interesting conversations. Rob Chalice isn't here at the moment. We're not related, by the way. Um, I'm not related to that man there either. Chalice is, Wales is a small country. Chalice is becoming a small country as well. Just so I mention that while I'm here. Um, three of us now, three of us here, excellent news. Uh, Rob's not here, but Rob actually gave some very, because I think he sees both sides of the argument, he's a promoter, festival organiser and an agent, gave some very constructive views. Um, but some things change as well. One of the reasons you don't get now in almost any agency standard terms issues about who controls the security is because there was a tragedy in uh, America with a band called Sugarland, the Indiana, Indiana State Fair, where there was a, a, a weather-related uh, series of deaths. And it appears, I can't vouch, it appears that in the contract, the ban were actually in charge at that time. So they're now facing civil claims because they were technically in charge, even though they probably weren't. Uh, and so the agencies immediately started changing their contracts because they suddenly realized that clause was dangerous uh, to their client. What does it cover? Okay, I'll speed up a bit now. Okay, one of the main things always is, how do the ban get paid? Europe's standard position, like many festivals, is they'll pay 50% in advance, they'll give 50% to an agent which should be held in escrow. Sometimes festivals change that. Sometimes they'll agree 100% in advance. That's fine. Put it in the contract. That's all we say. Um, we normally now 
insists we can deduct tax if we have to, because we're required to by a government, statutory legislation. We have to do it, we have to do it. The agents came back, and to be fair, we had a negotiation on that. They said, fine, but of course, the festival must likewise provide proper documentation when tax is withheld. Net of tax deals. If you are a promoter, you probably know this, but just in case you don't, never agree net of tax deals unless you know what you're doing. If you agree to pay an artist tax, you might find your bill for that artist substantially more than you put in your budget. Um, again, we say put that in the contract. Um, one of the clauses I think most Europe members found very offensive was the so-called 30-day cancellation clause, which meant you might sign a contract in January for a festival in July, but the artist reserved the right to cancel on 30 days' notice. So you didn't really know you had the artist until June. And most festivals said, well, we're, putting, we're going on sale, we've sent you a deposit, we need to know that you're performing at our festival. And it was very one-sided. And to be fair, most of the agents I've spoken to subsequently said, we can't believe we got away with that for so long, and why no one ever challenged it. Um, and, and William Morris at the CAA did agree with that. Um, so we moved that slightly. Um, we made some moves, though. All Europe festivals who participate in this scheme, and not all Europe festivals do yet, about 30 do now, um, have agreed to have minimum levels of public liability cover. There is no statutory level in any, uh, across Europe. It's all nat country by country. In fact, in most countries, like this country, there's no actual minimum level. So we set our own, and we said, as a minimum, festivals up to 15,000 people will have 2 million euros worth of cover, 15,000 to 50,000, 5 million, and over 50,000, 10 million. They're minimum levels of public liability cover. Uh, again, it was the festivals trying to do something proactive and be better organized. Um, we originally were going to insist on artists being insured. We had some problems with that. We, we presumed most artists signed to an agency would be, have their own public liability insurance. It appears some don't. We had a long and detailed debate about this, particularly in relation to uh, dance DJs. Um, and we were told by one agency, sadly, uh, the day before uh, the tragedy in Madrid, the thriller thing with Steve Aoki, whatever he's called, um, that DJs weren't high risk, um, so didn't need to be insured. Uh, our view at the moment is that artists should be insured, as well as the festival being insured. We, our, our position now is they have to tell us if they're not insured, so the festival can take a view on that. But we've been speaking to uh, a number of insurance brokers about developing, in effect, a, a shared insurance scheme for artists called a tulip scheme. Force majeure has been the biggest talking point debate of all particularly as our weather changes, and it's no secret I do agree in a festival, but our weather is changing. Um, we certainly have different weather and possibly different climate now. Um, there have been a number of weather-related tragedies and a bigger number of weather-related cancellations uh, recently. And the biggest debate of all, if you're an artist, is do I get paid if the festival gets flooded or is incapable of operating? And that's been, and is an, again, still an ongoing debate. The position at the moment, and it sounds woolly because it is, because we lifted these terms from another set of terms we saw, was if there is hazardous weather, that is force majeure, and both parties walk away and suffer their own losses. If there is inclement weather, for example, heavy rainfall locally, and the festival stops and cancels, for example, like uh, Creamfields a couple of years ago, that wouldn't be force majeure, and the band would still get paid their full fee. And that is a debate, because not all festivals agree with that, and not all artists agree with that, uh, those different positions. Uh, they all have their own agenda. Of course, you can insure against cancellation, but not all festivals want to pay an insurance premium either. But uh, we, it, that's been a debating point, but it was for us, from a Europe, a Europe point of view, that was better than always having to pay whatever happened. Uh, so we've moved on that. Uh, bad weather isn't now, in our view, enough to be a force majeure if it's localised bad weather. If it, was a, you know, if, if, if it was a tsunami or national flooding, uh, huge storms, air, airports shut, trains not working, that would be force majeure. But localised weather isn't. And that's a picture of rain, since it's on the, since it's on the agenda today, apparently. Um, artist illnesses. Again, we have had, sometimes artists do cancel, we understand that. 
but we were in a position, a number of festivals said, well, we keep artists just cancel and say we're ill and give no evidence. And we can't even then claim on any insurance we might have because we have nothing to claim with. So we said to the agents, and this has not been a bone of contention, um, we said to the agents, okay, we need to have a clause which we all agree to, where if an artist cancelled for illness, for illness, we get a doctor's certificate or a doctor's note. To be fair, they came back with an interesting point. They said, we wouldn't always want to do that because we may not want you to know what's wrong with our artist. And I thought, mm, that's actually that's true, actually. I can see that from a different hat on. So we agreed if, if an artist was ill, they can either send it to the festival rotor or in confidence, they could send it directly to an insurance assessor. Uh, so we agreed that, that was less contentious. Security, this is the new agreed position, which has changed, um, that uh, artists no longer want to be in charge of festival security. Hooray. So you are responsible for your own security. That was something we wanted from the start, and then since the Sugarland tragedy, everyone seems to agree with. So there we are. Are you with me so far, by the way? Uh, just checking. Um, <clears throat> another thing that Europe develop, or are developing right now, is they're developing a European-wide safety standard. It's being devised by Professor Chris Kemp, who uh, runs their YES group, uh, Europe Event Safety Group, which is uh, coming together of most of the big festivals and small festivals, uh, safety and security um, managers. Uh, he's doing an online software tool to enable all festivals to adhere to basic standards of health and safety and map out all the correct documentation that we all need nowadays to not only to have a safe festival, to, to comply with the varying legislation in most countries around Europe, but actually, basically, it's all pretty similar um, uh, in, 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 in essence. So that's being developed. That's, again, that's something proactive Europe have done. Backline equipment, this has been more of an issue. Most festivals can provide backline, can provide equipment, will do. If they're told about video walls up front and budget for it, they, of course, can provide that. The main position here has been festivals will provide whatever you ask for if you agree it up front, but they won't agree to rider demands because, again, they don't know what's in the rider because they've never seen it when they sign the contract. So at the moment, festivals agreeing they will provide backline. And another thing Europe have done proactively is all the festivals who take part in this scheme have now put their technical data and technical conditions online. So Glastonbury, we have a walled garden. You need a password to get into it, but every single tour director, we do it stage by stage for all our major stages. There'll be what the PA is, what the stage plot is, what the lighting plot is, what available backline there is, what the security is, what the dressing rooms are. That's all online. So the band or the tour director or the tour manager can go and look at that, and if they have specific requests, they can come back to us. What we can't deal with is 20 bands a day sending us various different requests for this and that, which we don't have. But if they have specific requests and they agree it up front with our bookers, then of course we'll go out of our way to provide that. So that's what I said. So all the Europe members have their own technical riders online now. Um, I don't even know that, that description. I don't do that sort of stuff. I just tell you about it. And my technical people do that sort of stuff. Um, so we cover more catering, dressing rooms, passes, security, transportation, noise limits, noise limits and curfews. Again, in the Europe terms, we've set them out, saying you have to adhere to our curfews. I call that the Bruce Springsteen clause, um, since he's caused a large number of... No, I can't say that. Um, so again, we make, we make most of the festivals, well, all the festivals take part in the scheme, make their technical details available. Actually, it was Rob Chalice who said, well, you know, I, sometimes I don't even know when I book the band what their production requirements will be. And we do understand that. So most of the festivals say, well, of course, if it's a headliner, and they come up with us with reasonable requests, not too late in the day, of course, we'll try and incorporate them into our festival production and make it happen. What you can't do is two days before an event, suddenly start putting 30 meter thrusts into your audience and replacing your PA. It's just not possible. So, I said at the start, some of the agents weren't very happy. They're still not that happy. Um, this is a comment from one of the agents. They accept there's far too much paperwork. There are vast amounts of riders, additional clauses, addendum A's flying around, uh, which no one, I mean, I'm probably one of the few people who actually read them. 
much to my sort of horror sometimes, although vague amusement as well sometimes. Um, it's not what I do at night. I don't sit in bed reading artist riders. Um, I have done it, but not anymore. Uh, we, uh, we try and, you know, the, the whole point about the Europe terms is to try and cut down paperwork. In the process, we may have created more at the moment as we to and fro about what should be agreed, but I think ultimately it will reduce paperwork because it'll make contracting much easier because actually when they, we contract, both sides will know what they're agreeing to. And I think that's quite important. At the moment, often neither side knows what they're agreeing to, which is um, not very satisfactory. There are difficulties. At the moment, the agents have their own business models. That model is they issue the contract, they issue their own addendums, their own documentation, and they attach or say they'll attach an artist rider. That doesn't work for the Europe members anymore. And they do represent clients. I have to accept agents are actually, in effect, middlemen. They're, they're deal makers. They do a deal between you, a festival, or you, a promoter, or you, a club, or you, a venue, and the artist. They're not party to that contract. They just facilitate it. So they have to listen to their artists because they're artists, they're clients. We're not their clients. We're the person they contract with. US riders in particular for a festival, and you know, Glastonbury isn't unknown, um, but we receive absolutely ludicrous documents sometimes, so unrealistic, they are, they are funny. Um, I can't say who it was, but we have one request. If you know Glastonbury, we have a pyramid stage. This is a, it wasn't Dolly Parton, by the way, it was a major country in Western Star who insisted that his wife and 11 guests would be seated front of stage. I almost did it. We almost, just to see, either in the pit or actually in the audience, because they wanted to have two waiters as well and full catering. And it was crossed my mind just to do it to see, but we didn't, obviously. Um, but riders are an ongoing problem, and the Europe terms are really there to counteract artist riders. They are available online. You can have a look at them if you want to. You can download them. They're free to download from the Europe site. I spoke to the AIM board about, it's about six months ago. Um, where's Claire? When did I speak to the AIM board? March. Yeah, March. In March, I think. Uh, and most of the members who, AIF members, uh, AIF, most of the AIF members who came to that were very interested in adopting the same or similar terms, United Kingdom. Um, I think they'll probably be the same because I think if you combine AIF with Europe, it means it's not just 80 festivals in Europe, it's another 40 in the United Kingdom. And in the more, you know, to be honest, it's a negotiation. The more festivals who work together, the better terms you will get. Um, and that's what we've got to. They're widely used in Europe now. They're generally accepted. Some agents don't like them. Again, it's always a negotiation whether or not they will be used. They tend to be used now. A glass and we'll use them for all our deals, unless we specifically agree otherwise. I will tell you this, I mean, I can't tell you what's in the contract, but when the Rolling Stones played Glastonbury, they sent me their standard contract. So I sent them our standard terms back. And we actually ended up just agreeing a four-page contract. We cut all the rubbish out, all the nonsense clauses, and just did it in four pages, which you can do. Of course you can, if you wanted to. Um, so we did cut down the paper that day. But the Europe terms are online. They're on the Europe website. So you can download them there. I think I've got two or three minutes left. So does any of you have any questions? And not, not specific cases. I'm very expensive. I'm not here to give you free legal advice, by the way. Um, you can see me afterwards, and I'll charge you through the nose for that. Um, Chris? Do you have to join Europe You can download the terms, but you can't download the, the free advisories. Oh, they're free to Europe members. So you could actually use the terms uh, for no cost at all, but we won't tell you how to use them. There you go. Good question. The lawyer. I didn't, that's not my idea. Anyone else got anything they want to ask me? Yeah, yes, gentleman there. Oh, Joe. Yeah. In terms of uh, force control, you know, the weather, when you yeah. the weather has to be bad to a certain extent, you know, who would decide that? <laughs> that's, that's the problem. When I, when I draft that, when I saw that clause, it's in a Live Nation contract without doing me, I said, it means nothing. Who would decide it ultimately would be a judge, by the way. Uh, the only override we've put in is that if a public authority or a statutory authority, so the police, fire, health service, local authority, said it was hazardous weather, then it is force majeure. The risk is if a festival decides 
that it's inclement weather but not hazardous weather, so it goes ahead because they don't want to not, they want the artist to perform and something goes wrong, that could be a real issue. And one of the Norwegian festivals said they, they weren't that happy with this definition. I agree with them. It's a bit vague, to be honest, actually. It, what, is, what is hazardous weather? I don't know. What's inclement weather? I don't know. What's the difference? No one knows. It would, if it ever went wrong, if it ever came to, to a dispute, I imagine it would go to court and a judge would decide, which is not very satisfactory. Anything else? Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, one, 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 one. I don't think that. Thank you. No. Um, my question is, when Yeah. Okay, in, in English law, you can't do that. Okay. Uh, it's a weird, I know they do put it in. If you don't, within, probably within five days, of these terms are accepted and binding on you. In English law, very basically, you have to have offer and acceptance. So you're not in any way bound? You, no, I, I, need to, I'm, I have to say, I need to, see, I need to know how you negotiated that to get to that point. Yeah. If you just literally just receive, I could send you an email saying, I'm in a band, by the way. Um, <laughs> punk rock band, yay played Exit and Pahoda this year, uh, and Kendall Calling. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, I do love many things. Uh, if I just send you an email saying you're booking my band next week for £15,000, uh, really, that would be great for me, uh, that's not binding. You have to agree. You have to agree to terms. So I, I say I'll give you £15,000, you say yes, confirm on dates. Yeah. Then you send me a long contract. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So anyway. It shouldn't be, no. It would depend how it was worded. I'm being a lawyer now, but I have to be. It would depend how it was worded. It shouldn't be, no, it shouldn't be, no. Okay. I mean, ITB have a clause saying that, I know. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I take the notes of it, really, because it's not agreed, because they require you to sign that contract, so it needs to be signed. Okay. If you sign it, it's binding, yeah. obviously. No, it shouldn't be, no. Okay, thank you very much.